In my first sermon in this series from Matthew chapter 9, I asked the question, since the harvest field is full of lost and broken people, and since God is already at work in their lives, do we see them, these ones for whom Christ died? Uh, the, the people who live in the other houses, in the apartment complexes, in the neighborhoods in which we live, do we see them? The, the people that we uh, work with on a regular basis or go to school with on a regular basis, do we, do we see them, these ones for whom Christ died? Perhaps even members of our own family, do we see them? And that's one kind of lost sheep that we've been talking about for about six weeks now. But there's another kind of lost sheep that Jesus wants us to see and to pursue in addition to these. I've talked about the first kind of lost sheep with these different stories of, of, of these people coming to Christ or being found. I, I told you about Allison, who was a Jewish woman who, who found Jesus to be her Messiah in Christ. I, I told you about Brenda, who was going through the religious motions, even though she was going to church weekly, she just realized that she wasn't up to date in her walk with the Lord. I, I told you about Asia who had tried out all these other religions to try to find healing and help and hope, but it was in Jesus that she found all of that. And he's the one who broke the darkness in her life. I told you about Becca, who even at four years old, was able to recognize and be aware that she needed her sins to be forgiven. She needed the Savior. And even at age 12, she recognized her need to give all to the Lord and fully surrender to Him. I told you about Marshall Cox, the welder from Danville, Illinois, who raised boys to be respectful, but he didn't know how to pray and he didn't know to whom to pray. And he came to the Lord in a revival meeting and his whole household did as well. I told you about these lost sheep. Does that spring in us this joy and gratitude that these lost people are being found? Does that give us a a hope that Jesus is searching for the lost sheep? Does it fuel in us this, this desire to intercede for them all the more and to pray for them and for their salvation? Well, that's one kind of lost sheep. But there's another kind of lost sheep that Jesus wants us to see and pursue in addition to these. And, uh, and, and during these weeks, I've also been asking you to make these prayer commitments. And I have them on the pew again if you haven't received one or out there in the foyer. I've been asking us to pray for at least 30 days for at least three people. And I've given you this guide to prayer for 30 days, starting points for prayer for those who don't know Jesus. And I've asked you to commit to that. And I've asked you to join me in prayer to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. And I've asked you to pray the three open prayer, which is, Lord, since you're already at work opening their, this person's heart, when you open the door, would you also open my mouth? So we're, we're praying for their salvation, yes, but we're also saying, God, I'm open to be used of you. I'm, I'm willing to be used of you. I, I want to be used of you to witness or to share or to testify or to come alongside, however it is that you would want to use me. And I, and I suggested... <laughs> that when we commit to pray for something or someone in that way, we often begin to care more and more about those people or that circumstance. God, God begins to put them a greater burden on our heart for them. So have, have we experienced that in the last four or five weeks? Has there been a growing burden, a, a growing joy for, for, for seeing these people coming to the Lord? Have we been faithful in prayer? Have we begun to care for these people more and more? Have we been open and willing to work in his harvest field? Well, those are one kind of lost sheep. But there's another kind of lost sheep that Jesus wants us to see and pursue in addition to these. And I bring all this back up because this text that we're working with today kind of brings us back to where we began with lost sheep. Even though there's two more weeks in this sermon series, Jesus brings us back to lost sheep, but it's a different kind of lost sheep than the ones that we've been talking about so far. It's not, it's not the sinner and tax collector pictured in Luke 15. It's a different kind of lost sheep. And I'm, I'm bringing these questions back up because uh, I'm echoing Jesus' question, have you understood these things from last week's passage? 
And, I, and what I mean by that is more than just are, are we able to pare it back what we've heard, but has it begun to make an impact in our seeing and doing and thinking and praying and being? And I've also asked it because Jesus wants to tell us about another kind of lost sheep. It's a different kind of lost sheep with a different and maybe even difficult twist. (laughs) We find our text today in Matthew 18, verses 6 through 14. This is the word of the Lord. I would invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you that a great millstone were fastened around your neck and were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the one who... Woe to the world because of the stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling blocks come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if, one, if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it away. It's better for you to enter eternal life than with one eye than, than to have two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. Take care that you don't despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, in heaven their angels continually to see, continually see my, the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he, leave the 90, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. The word of the Lord. The lost sheep in the, in the parable in verses 14 through, uh, 12 through 14 here, as I mentioned, isn't the center pictured in the Luke 15 parable. From, uh, from the context here, it shows that this lost sheep is actually a disciple or a member of the church already who has wandered from the truth and from the flock of God. Donald Hagner says, Matthew doesn't specify the cause of the strain of such a disciple, but from the context as well, it must be the conduct of other disciples, other believers, other sheep that have have prompted them to wander and to leave or to go. And Jesus says, notice that such persons are not to be despised or written off. And notice the the man who owns the sheep doesn't say, well, I've got 99 sheep. Uh, I guess that one's lost to the wolves. No, he is intent to find this one lost sheep that has strayed away and bring it back. And if he does find it, it's the cause of great joy. Instead of writing them off, instead of saying, okay, they're lost, no, every attempt is made to restore the wandering sheep back to the fold. This reflects the heart of the Father, verse 14, who does not want even one to perish. It also reflects the ministry of Jesus, who says about himself in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And if you look in your Bible, uh, I didn't, my Bible doesn't have verse 11, but verse 11 is in there. Maybe it's in your Bible, but in, if it's not in there, you'll find probably like my Bible does, that there are there are some manuscripts that add verse 11 that says something very similar to Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to save the lost. And whether or not it's included, it's certainly a truth that's being communicated here with this parable. The Son of Man goes after the wandering sheep. Both the sinner, the tax collector, those hated, the, the people who are doing all those wrong things, as well as the one who's been hurt by somebody and has left the fold and wandered away from the truth. And here, in this case, that's who Jesus is talking about a disciple, a believer, a member of the church who has wandered from the flock. <clears throat> and these people, as Joy pointed out this morning, must be of s- such, such value that the sheep would go, or that the shepherd would go all that way to find it, to rescue it. 
That's what the shepherd does in our passage. Don Hager com- comments, such persons are worth so much that the shepherd would leave the 99 still in the church in order to go and rescue the one that had wandered away. All disciples, all members of the church are of an estimable worth and significance. So when anyone wanders, it's cause for concern. In fact, such a person is also in danger. That word to go astray means to wander from the truth. It means to uh, wander from, from the security of the fold. And so such a person is to is to be rescued or, or to gaunt, be gone after. Uh, and the reason why is the longer that person is away, the longer that person stays away, may stay away. They might not even darken the door of a church again for, 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 for the rest of their life or, or for a very long time. They, 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 might, they might be hardened in their hearts, especially if no one seems to care to even go and try to go after them. Such a person is to be sought after the, the parable depicts. In fact, such a person is also in danger because they may, in fact, abandon their faith in Christ altogether. And as already pointed out here, this is a person, this, this lost sheep is depicting someone who has wandered away because of the conduct of other disciples or has been hurt by other believers. And unfortunately, in the church, I'm not talking about our church uh, uh, specifically, but overall the church has hurt a lot of people. Unfortunately, that's true. A lot of people have been hurt by the church, by fellow believers. Carlo Coretta states the dilemma well. How baffling you are, O church, and yet how I love you. How you have made me suffer, and yet how much I owe you. I should like to see you destroyed, and yet... I need your presence. You have given me so much scandal, and yet you have helped me understand sanctity. I've seen nothing in this world more devoted to obscurity, more compromise, more false, and I've touched nothing more pure, more generous, and more beautiful. How often I have longed to shut the doors of my soul to your face, but how often I have desired to rest in the safety of your arms. Unfortunately, when we've been hurt or or wounded, or wronged in some way, or sinned against, the beautiful part of that is forgotten fairly quickly. It's put behind us fairly quickly. As an example, let me tell you about Taylor's story. Stephen Mansfield tells the true story about Taylor and this church where he was at, and he had a significant men's ministry. In fact, they had uh, this this ministry that was reaching a lot of men and, and also... Um, Really, there was real transformation in the lives of these men. But somehow, in a major transition of their church, Taylor got hurt by those in his own community. So much so that he left the church, and he wouldn't speak to anybody about it. Wouldn't speak to anybody at all. And everybody else in the church figured, well, he'll eventually come back. But he never did. But he didn't. But he didn't. And unfortunately... That's where the story often ends in many cases. One or more persons is wronged or hurt, and there's hurt back and forth for whoever they're arguing with or whatever the situation is, and and then that person leaves, and then the rest of the church is left to figure out, well, what's going on here? What do we do? And oftentimes the result is, well, I don't know that we can do anything. And that's the end of the story. But that's not what happens in the parable here. That's not what Jesus goes on to instruct in the rest of Matthew 18 that David read this morning about forgiveness. But look at the parable. What happens? No, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after the one who has wandered away. That's what's depicted here. It's also true that a disciple of Jesus or a member of a church may may wander from the flock or wander from the truth, not because of anything that somebody did or said to hurt them or wrong them, but just because in our lives there are seasons where we tend to, to grow cold or drift away, or there's a wilderness season, and unless the community comes around that sheep, they'll start to disengage and distance themselves and wander away. And yet, if there isn't pastoral care or congregational care that reaches out to them, that person will also begin to think, well, nobody cares about me anyway. I might as well not come back. 
This kind of disengagement or distancing often happens in youth ministry. Not because somebody did something or did anything to hurt anybody, but just because the transition in their lives happens, this often occurs. And, and I unfortunately know all about this as a youth pastor for seven years here. I've seen it too many times. What happens is, even though uh, we need age-specific ministries, because youth especially need need people who are their own age, to have this sense of belonging in the community. But what often happens is after they graduate, they also graduate from their faith. They begin to to disengage from the church altogether and their faith in Christ Jesus. In fact, I, uh, I know of a friend who's a pastor whose son has told them that his chosen career path won't leave time for Jesus. So Jesus is good for you, he's told them, but not for me. And so he's walking into his future without the church and without Jesus. And it's very, very disheartening. Very, very disheartening. And the church in general is still trying to figure out all the reasons that happens. And the church in general is still trying to figure out, well, what do we do about this? But one thing is clear from this parable. We can't give up on them. You see what the shepherd does? He goes after the wandering ones. He goes after them. He doesn't give up on them. He doesn't say, oh, I guess you're lost and you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna suffer the consequences. No, he goes after the lost ones. He, he wants to rescue them. That's what the great shepherd does. So we can't give up on them. Not just teens though, not just teens, but anyone who's wandered away from the truth, from the flock of God. See, the the great shepherd is also seeking these lost ones too. These ones that have wandered because they've been hurt or been wronged in some way by another believer or a pastor or, or because they just began to disengage and distance themselves and nobody seemed to care. The great shepherd of the sheep is also seeking after them. Verse 14 says again, the father doesn't want even one of them to perish. And did you know, church, we're invited into that rescue operation? James 5, 19 and 20 say this. Make it very clear that the church is called to this. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, there it is, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever has turned that person from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. I love what Taylor's church did to reach out to to Taylor after this happened. The men of the church, it was an expansive ministry. There was about 150 men that were part of this ministry that he was behind and, and and served in, and they got together, and let's say, and they decided that they were going to, they were going to do something very bold. This is amazing. They decided to take shifts, and they were going to camp out in Taylor's yard, in shifts. And in fact, they they had a whole setup going. They had they had electric uh, lines from other houses so that they could have their TVs in the yard. They had grills and smokers. They would have a barbecue there in the front yard. And they were taking shifts until Taylor came out. They weren't leaving. That's what the, their determination was. And so they, they started in on this. And Taylor did not appreciate it. <laughs> Taylor didn't like it one bit. He was angry with them. He didn't like the signs out there, even though they were communicating love to him. They said, Taylor, we know you're in there. Come out. We love you. He didn't want those signs in his yard. He didn't want those people in his yard. In fact, so much so that he called the police on his former friends. In fact, the police were out there almost twice a day. And every time the police came to the door, Taylor would come out to explain the situation. And as soon as these men saw Taylor, they would explode with cheers. Taylor! Cheering him on. Excited to see him. That happened for six days. Six days these men were camped out on his yard. And on the sixth day, when he had called the police again, this time, when the men exploded with their cheers, Taylor broke down in tears. And he came out to them and he expressed his 
his uh, sorrow for the situation and 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 how sorry he was and he and he came out and he and he and he conversed with these men who had refused to go away and Stephen Manfield says so is the power of a committed friendship but I would say something even better is being depicted here such is the power of a church who has captured and has received the heart of the father for those who have wandered away from the flock that's what's being depicted here. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Now I know that isn't what happens every time. I know that isn't what happens. Even, even if the attempts are made to reach out to those who have wandered away. I know that isn't what always happens. But, and the words already quoted, restoration of the wonder is the goal. Restoration of the wanderer is the goal. Back to the fold, back to the church, because each one of them is of significant value and worth to the Father. I would suggest that this includes not only people like Taylor who had significant ministry, but everyone. Not just the people that we would deem important, but everyone, because everyone is important to the shepherd. I would suggest that this includes those who have been gone for a long time and who are not part of any church now. Restoration is still the goal. Whether to, to uh, this church or another, but to the Lord especially, that's, that's still the goal, isn't it? Because they are of an of an of a significant value and and someone might say well that the odds of that happening would be would be pretty slim wouldn't it for them for someone who has been gone for years to return to the fellowship of believers and to the lord it seems like a lost cause but let me tell you i had to i had to i had to confront my own heart in this and i still have to believe and i still do believe and i had to ask the lord to help me believe that nothing is impossible for him He's the one who spans the gap. He's the one who's already at work in their hearts. That's what we believe about provenient grace, right? He's already at work in their hearts before we even cared again about those people. He's still, he's still seeking and searching for them. And so with that goal of restoration in mind, I want to say to everyone here, everyone who will read this sermon that I send out or watch it online. Everyone who's ever been part of this church, if I have ever wronged you or said something that hurt you, I would ask you for your forgiveness. And I would ask you to tell me about it because I want to know. I want to know. I want to make that right with you. I'm not aware of anything. But if I have hurt you or wronged you in any way, I would ask you for your forgiveness. I would... I would ask you to forgive the church if the church has sinned against you, whether this church or, or some other church. If the, if, if the church has wronged you, I'm thinking of a, a one lady who told me a couple of weeks ago that the church, not this church, but another church, asked her not to attend the church anymore because she got a divorce. If the church has wronged you in those kinds of ways, in whatever way that is, I would ask you for your forgiveness and God's mercy. I'm not apologizing for the truth of the gospel. I'm not apologizing for God's word. I'm not, I'm not condoning any sin. But that includes any way that I've wronged you. That includes any sin that the church has committed against any of you or those who would hear this message. And so for the truth not spoken in love, forgive us. For any stumbling block that we've put in your path, Forgive us. For any racism, implicit or explicit, in attitude, word, or action, forgive us. For, for any lack of pastoral or congregational care, forgive us. For any ignoring or dismissal or neglect of your needs, forgive us. For any hypocrisy, forgive us. For any hurt that we've caused, Forgive us. This is not an exhaustive list, I know. But for any sin that we've committed against anyone or any of you, I would ask for your forgiveness and for God's mercy. 
And now I want to speak to the teens who were part of the youth group when I was youth pastor. None of them are here this morning, unfortunately. It's been 15 years since I was the youth pastor. But I want to speak to them. And so if you'll, if you'll allow me, I'm just going to address them on the camera so they can see me speaking to them. I know it's been 15 years, but I still care about you and love you very much. And I wish you were here. I wish I could see your kids grow up. I wish I could be the one who baptized your children into the Christian faith. But if not here, somewhere, be part of a church somewhere. And won't you return to the Lord, this one who's seeking after you right now? Even one of you is too many wandering from the truth. I know many of you are following after Jesus, and I'm grateful for that. But if you aren't, would you, would you hear him? Would you, would, you, would you see that he's pursuing you? His love for you remains. And I would invite you to reach out to me uh, in some way. My phone number is still the same, 816-392-6441. I'd love to hear from you, to talk with you, to get together with you. But not only do I still love and care for you, but do you remember what I said at the end of every youth group? God loves you, and so do I. In response this morning, if the musicians would come, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I would invite us to ask the Father for His heart for the lost ones. Both those who are lost and broken and do not know and have never known Jesus, but also those who have wandered from the fold, whoever those might be, to give us His heart for them. His heart is that none of them should perish. Verse 14. Also that we would ask the, ask the Lord for the determination of the shepherd. That we would have this, 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 uh, this same desire to pursue and go after the lost ones. That we would ask for the power of the Holy Spirit because we cannot be part of his rescue operation without his help, without his empowerment, without his courage that he would give us, without uh, his leadership in the moments when those opportunities arise. We need him. We need him to, to help us. We need him to fill us, to fill us again. We need his, his control in our lives. We need to have his leadership in every way in this. And then I would also invite us to pray for the lost ones. We have been praying for those. We have a list here. But if there would be others you would want to add to that list in terms of the lost sheep that we've been talking about this morning, I would invite you to do that. And I would invite you to find your place of prayer this morning, and then I'll, I'll pray together for us. If you'd play, let's, uh, let's find our place of prayer this morning.